And um, welcome, I guess they're not snowbirds, let's be ski birds that we haven't seen <laughs> since last winter. Welcome back, North. Um, I have a few announcements. Um, first of all, the flowers that are gracing up here are from the Celebration of Life service for Janet Pace, which was held yesterday. Um, if you haven't sent me information uh, to go in the church directory, I have my computer downstairs and I will be tracking you down to try and fill in the blanks on that. So don't leave until I have your name, address, and all that info. Um, several of us are going, as you know, on December 17th to Rutland to see uh, the Charles Dickens different version of a Christmas story. And uh, you need to buy your tickets on your own, but you need to let us know if you've done that and you're coming because we'd all like to go out for lunch um, before the uh, program, which is at 3 in the afternoon on Sunday, the 17th of December. So please let us know so we know how many um, we can count on. On the day before, perhaps a Saturday, we'd like to do our Christmas caroling, but first we have to check it out with the Gill Home if that date works for them. So tentatively put it on your calendar. Um, let's see, what other announcements? Prayer concerns, if you have requested somebody go on our list of prayer concerns and our prayers have worked for them and they can come off the prayer list, please let us know that as well. Um, and Terry, I believe you have an announcement. Yes, uh, my mother Polly, that everyone's been praying for, I have her in her apartment, Nick and I, take care of her and next Sunday is her 90th birthday mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, after church um, we're going to do like a little birthday party for her so I'm here gonna, here here yeah. Oh, yeah I don't even know where I am where am I <laughs> so uh, yeah I gotta get Brett Harlow is her first cousin so I'm gonna see if Brett can be here and uh, so hopefully everybody can just say hello to Polly Thank you. Are there other announcements from the congregation? Yes, Penny. Um, the uh, tree lighting in the um, on the green is going to be the day after Thanksgiving at 5 p.m. So hopefully people can come and George in the past you brought caroling books. Is that you do it again? <laughs> Day after Thanksgiving at the Green, and hopefully we'll have some impromptu caroling. Okay. Other announcements from the congregation? George. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm uh, president of the Fletcher Farm Foundation Board, and uh, just let you know that again this year we come up for our tax exempt status, and I need a petition with signatures from members of the community. Um, I hit some people up before the church. Um, but I'm asking that you don't cast it around during church service. I'll catch people later so that you can concentrate on the purpose that we're here for. The Fletcher Farm Foundation does tremendous things for the community and donates about $90,000 worth of uh, services and things back to the community. So we're asking for people to sign this petition so that we can go once again on an article for town meeting for the town to vote on tax exempt status. And this is, we've, it's been happening since 1933. So I hope it'll happen again, but we have to go through this process for 35 years. So I don't know where the sheet is, but I'll, oh, okay. So I'll collect it later and try to catch a few more people after church. And it is only for residents of Cavendish and um, Lovell. Thank you very much. Richard, did you have your hand up? Yes, I did. Um, Christmas is coming, and it's all been very good this year. So I'm looking to uh, raise some money to help buy a new snowblower. Maybe I can pay for half. And, um, and uh, I can do the sand and the salt myself. <coughs> if somebody would like to shovel, then I may share the job or give the job away. I still don't get all the information. I went to the store and they still have the same amount of snowboards for sale. Um, 
So, um, Richard, just, you know, the board did talk about that. We're so grateful for all you've done. And I think that we have some possible ideas for this um, winter, so we can talk to you about it afterwards. But thank you so much for your service and thoughts about that. Yeah. If there are no more announcements, then let us be in a spirit of worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Please stand for the call to worship. Maker of mountains and valleys, fields and forests, rivers, lakes, and oceans, thank you for all creation. Help us to be good stewards of all you have given us, sharing your resources with all. As mountains surround valleys, you surround your people. Continue to offer us your sheltering protection. You call us to have upright hearts, loving all, and acting out of love. Join us, Holy One. Show us how to live your love. Amen. You may be seated. I dream for a day when we don't have to center peace with so much needs around the world, but we're not there yet. So let us center ourselves in peace radiating peace out into the world where it is so very much needed. Again, Terry will pray, uh, play through this once and then we'll jump in in the last two verses on the cup. <laughs>
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness. Sovereign God, we confess that life is hard. We don't always make the best choices. But all too often, we realize the options before us are lacking. We are overwhelmed with the enormity of the world's problems. Sometimes we turn away completely. Sometimes we respond with our tribal allegiances first in line. Bitterness and resentment are easy guides. Help us seek wisdom and clarity, compassion and presence, hope and peace over shallow victories, material gain and violence of the mind, body, or spirit. Bless us to be peacemakers, hope sharers, and love spreaders in the world for our neighbors and for your glory. Amen. Now, in the silence of our hearts, let us consider those things we failed to do that we should have, and those things that we did that we should not have done. When we ask, there is always an assurance of pardon. Friends, God is merciful and journeys with us as we navigate uncertain terrain. God is still at work in us and through us that we might have flourishing and abundant lives in community with one another. Receive the grace God grants to begin anew when our journey stalls or diverts from the path of kingdom. That grace is yours. Amen. Our first scripture today is Psalm 123. It doesn't happen to be in on your will, so I will share it with you. This is a psalm seeking God's help in a time of need. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress. So our eyes look to the Lord, our God, until he has mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us. For we have had more than enough of contempt. Our soul has had more than its fill of the scorn of those who are at ease and of the contempt of the proud. <laughs> Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. 
For he had 900 chariots of iron and had oppressed the Israelites cruelly for 20 years. At that time, Deborah, a prophetess, and the wife of Lapidoth was judging Israel. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go take position at Mount Tabor, bringing 10,000 from the tribe of Naphtali and the tribe of Zebulun. I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the Wadi Kishun, with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. This ends the Old Testament reading. I'm pretty mean. I said to Linda, good luck with that one. <laughs> it's not like I knew how to pronounce them either. I said, just say it with confidence. You know, none of us know. <laughs> um, but I couldn't leave out a reading um, that was strong, but a strong woman, Deborah. In there. Um, our, our gospel reading takes from Matthew, much easier to pronounce, chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. You will uh, notice, if you were here last week, it picks up directly from where we left off in the scripture. Um, adding a second parable. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. I mean, uh, (laughs) to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them, and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received just one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those same slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents and saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into your master's joy. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward saying, master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow? And to gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And on my return, I would have received what was my own, plus interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to the all who have all those who have more will be given and they will have an abundance but from those who have nothing even what they have will be taken away as for this worthless slave throw him into the outer darkness where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth here and ends the reason three thanks to you god May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. So we began today with a song asking for mercy in a time of trouble. 
We can imagine that being said by the Israelites in the Judges scripture, who had brought that trouble upon themselves due to sin, and were suffering doing hard labor under King Jabin. However, after a time, God forgave them. The mercy asked for in the psalm seems to be delivered in Judges, and it shows the abundance of God's love. Through the prophetess Deborah, God grants them mercy as Deborah tells Barak to bring troops to gain their freedom. Deborah is using her talent as both a prophetess and a judge in this scripture. Her court was outside, under a palm between Ramah and Bethel. She would sit there and people would bring her their problems, their disputes to settle. Deborah is actually the only leader in the book of Judges who is actually shown to be performing the task that the book is named after. She's also one of a handful of women shown to have a rules of respected power and position in the Bible. So God called her to this dual role of prophetess and judge, and she answered. She definitely used her gifts, her talents. Our Matthew scripture today is the second of two parables of end times. And it comes on the heels of last week's parable of the bridesmaids, waiting for the bridegroom to come home, as was their duty. Five were prepared with lamps full of oil despite his late arrival, and five were unprepared and thus not let in. The message was to be prepared for whenever Jesus would come. This week's scripture continues that idea of being prepared, but with an investment twist. At first reading, I found myself feeling sorry for the third servant, who buried the one talent of money left to him from a man he considered to be harsh, gaining from no work of his own. This servant was driven by fear, and fear made him minimize risks. He would protect the money, not risk any loss, not risk the anger of his master. By the way, one talent of money was no small amount. It was the equivalent to about 15 years of daily wages for a laborer. In the servant's mind, he faithfully returned what he had been given by that harsh man, and that seemed like enough. He could have run off with the money, but he didn't, yet his reward was to be thrown out into the darkness where there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Like the lazy bridesmaids, he was unprepared and thus was left out. Of course, this is a parable, and like an allegory, the characters and the events are symbolic, and we're supposed to learn something. Raise your hand if you've ever invested money in the stock market, bonds, 401k, 403b, IRA, etc. Now keep your hand up if you've ever lost any money over time. Okay? Me too. I think we've all invested and lost. I remember uh, that one of the pamphlets that came from my investment advisors was called The Patient Investor, and it had a picture of a turtle on it. Being patient is a part of being prepared when it comes to investments, isn't it? I remember going into investment seminars in my 20s uh, with my then employer, State Farm Insurance. They would talk to us about how saving even a little now, decades from retirement would make a big difference. And I listened, and I was really grateful for doing that. And the bit that I was able to put aside every week amassed to a decent amount after 12 years there. At the time, I decided to take a break from work and spend six years at home with my children. About a year later, there was one of those crashes, and I watched about a third of my money disappear. And I remembered, be patient. You're not retiring yet. It's okay. And about 10 years later, it got back to where it was before the crash. But it did get back there. It took some work. I remembered what I was taught. Part of being prepared is being patient. But of course, you have to also trust the advice that you were given, as I did, and I'm sure many of you have. So was this master going on a journey really as harsh as the, sir, the third servant judged him to be? Well, one might think that the very act of trusting his servants, called slaves, with such large sums of money according to his faith in them, is not so harsh. Doesn't that indicate a degree of trust? He has put them in leadership roles with a whole lot of money. 
He has shown faith in them. He has, as we say in teaching, stepped back so they can step up, so they can show what they can do. And he has even given them an amount of money that he thinks each one of them can handle. Then when he gets back, he rewards those who took the risk by saying, you have been trustworthy with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. One can imagine they get promotions, formerly in the role of a lowly servant or even a slave. These first two are now going to be CEO and CFO of his business. They were patient investors who were prepared. They used their talents, literally and figuratively, but took risks in doing so. But both of those risks paid off, and they were rewarded in a far greater way than just money. They had earned new titles. The third servant wasn't dishonest, but he wasn't a risk taker. He could not even risk changing his way of thinking about his master. He could not see the opportunity that was presented to him because he wallowed in a fear that he tried to bury with the money. What if the first two servants had invested and lost? <clears throat> Remember, the scripture says the property owner gave to each according to his ability. It makes one more me wonder, according to ability to do what? It could have been their investment ability. Although one wonders how much of the ability a servant or a slave could possibly have had. Maybe it was about their ability, their capacity to take risks. Or maybe it was about the amount of faith he had in each one to figure it out. Hire an investment consultant if needed and take those risks, even if it meant failing. The fact that he gave differing amounts to each of the three servants meant he knew them. He understood that taking that responsibility, that risk, would be easier for some than others. This doesn't seem like a harsh man, especially when we consider how he rewarded those who did take the risk. Remember that Jesus was sharing this parable just a few days before he would be killed. He was trying to maximize every teachable moment because he wasn't going to be around to keep those lessons coming. And followers needed to be prepared for his death resurrection, and coming again. And being fearful or timid wasn't going to work. So guess what? We are still preparing for those end times. We are still waiting. Are we ready? Jesus, the master of the story, wants us to live our lives in a state of readiness, investing for the future, not wrongly in fear. Except this type of investment isn't so much to save in a 401k to have a comfortable retirement, although that's a good thing to do as well. But no, instead, we Christians, particularly in an ever-increasingly secular society, take risks just in believing, just in being here. But rather than being fearful of all the what-ifs and that's in the world, we are called to action, to help where we can in this world, even as we prepare for the next. We're not called to bury ourselves or our talents, but to be prepared, to be useful, and to use our talents right now. The fear that held the third servant back meant that he was not doing anything. His talent was buried. He did, not do, he did no good to or for anyone, including himself, as he finds out. Our challenge is to answer the call to take the risks for our faith, to get out of our comfort zones and following Christ's model of service, even when we don't see the return. Pastor Steve Garnas Holmes in his Unfolding Life website shares a reflection that I think puts this in perspective. And what are the others, the ones who faithfully took the talents but didn't make a killing of the stock market? The one who forgave 70 times seven and it came to nothing? The one who marched in protests and wrote to her senator, but it was ignored. The one who loved her enemy, and they just scorned her. The one who prayed and meditated, but never once kept his mind from wandering. The one whose praise was never accepted. The one who sang the song of their soul, and it really wasn't all that lovely. The one who told the truth and looked like a fool the one who shared his faith, and nobody, 
not a soul cared or believed. The one who really loved Jesus, but didn't ever see what she had to offer. What of them? To them the master turns and says gently, well done, good and faithful servant. I know of one who served perfectly and ended in failure, crucified. You have been trustworthy over a few things. I will put you in charge of greater things, for love is always risked and never wasted. Amen. Amen. Our next hymn is number 399, Take My Life and Let It Be, number 399. and we'll start with Joyce from the congregation. Yes, Mark. Yes, a joy for the wonderful gift of your talents for you and George last night. It was just, anybody here missed it, you, you missed a really great presentation. So thank you for all the work that went into that. Thank you. Other Joyce? George. Um, Lynn and I were privileged to just uh, spend some time over in Turkey in the Mediterranean. We took a cruise on the Mediterranean with, and I tell people, with 3,000 of our closest non-English speaking friends. <laughs> <laughs> there were, everything was done in six languages. Uh, we sat down to dinner. We sat with Russian people. One time we had lunch with some Russian folks, Italian and Spanish. <laughs> it was really interesting <clears throat> to communicate with the Russian people. It was interesting because we, everybody would say like, so where are you from? Yeah. And they went, Russia. And we went, okay. <laughs> and they said, where are you from? And we went, from the US. And they went, okay. <laughs> but it was interesting that the conversations that we've had with all of the people 
wherever we were, we spent time together, we spoke together in whatever way we could, we ate together, we recreated together, we played, we drank wine together, we talked a bit about politics, particularly the people from Russia that we talked with, they were, how do I word this? They really did not talk favorably about their government. They talked about they wish they could get out of their country. Um, we share some of those thoughts too. But, um, so it was just really interesting that, and I actually commented and I said, it's so wonderful that we can be here together from different countries whose political leaders have different views than perhaps we do, but we're here enjoying each other's company. We're all God's people, and that's what's really important. Despite all the politics, people are people everywhere. They're loving, they're kind, they are just normal human beings. And it's so reinforcing to see that with all of the travels that Linda and I are fortunate enough to do, particularly in this particular time when there's such issues going on in our world. And I just wanted to share that. Then we met just wonderful people from countries that our political leaders don't agree with and all of that kind of stuff. And I've talked to them, but it really was moving to me. And I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you. All done. Other Joyce uh, from our friends on Zoom. Joyce to share. I have a friend. It's a joy to be here with you and feel welcome. Thank you. So nice to have you two back. Thank you. I want to share a couple of joys. Um, we've been praying for my sister for a long time. And she had a pacemaker put in, and she's finally doing well with that. And last week, um, she qualified for disability, which is a huge relief to our family. Um, and it gives her the hope and the ability to keep moving forward with a positive, healthy lifestyle. So I'm grateful for that. My other joy is I had cataract surgery on Monday. And boy, I didn't realize what I wasn't seeing, and I will be scrubbing my house much more. <laughs> Dang, maybe that ignorance was bliss, but anyway. Um, is that a joy? <laughs> no, it, it is such a joy. I have one contact in and one nothing, and I can read from distance and up close, and looking wow. forward to the next one in a couple of weeks. So those are my joys. Thanks. <laughs> And concerns, we'll start with uh, Zoom. Concerns on Zoom? <clears throat> concerns from the congregation. Yes, Steve. Some prayers for my neighbor, Kate, who's just, life has dumped a bunch of burdens on her, and she's really struggling with it, so I ask that God give her strength. Right, Kate. Other concerns? I would ask for prayers for Kevin Coons, who helped us last night with our show. Uh, he has runs of AFib, and uh, so he went to the hospital today to get shocked into a normal rhythm. The Lord be with you. And also Let us pray. God of God. In this beautiful sunny day, it would be easy to forget the pain in the world, but we know it's there. And we ask for your healing blessings on hearts that are angry and violent with war and pain. Please bring your comforting embrace to all of those harmed by war and violence. Give them hope and put people in their way who will help them to recover from this. We also pray for strength for Kate and for all who suffer challenges in life. We know that you can hold them up and we ask you to do so. Please help Kevin and his continued work to get that heart beating and marching in the order that it should. And all those who suffer with any kind of pain in their lives. In particular, we pray for all of those on our prayer list. James and Judy, me and Sheila, Jenny and Ann, Jan, Meg, Arden and Mary, Beth and David, John, Florian and Judy, Emily, Carol, Trudy, Colin, Camilla, Chelsea, Bob, 
Lee, Greg, Eric and Gavin, Mac, Bert, Barbara, Laura, Dick and Brenda, Colin, Polly, and all of those still struggling from the floods. But Lord, we are so grateful that we can also come to you in joy. Joy for entertainment. Time to just be and enjoy those love letters that George and Linda presented last night. Time for travel and the possibility to break down barriers of difference. To understand that you created us all fully human and that we don't have to put out barriers. We can find ways to reach out to one another. We pray you show us more how to do that. And we thank you for recovered health and sight and hope for living for those who have been downtrodden, like Nicole. And let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Go forth knowing that you are blessings. You're a blessing being here, and you've invested in your faith by your very presence. Share that faith and that blessing with your family this week, with friends, and with all you come in contact with. Go forth in peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you.